So this morning we are joined by John Powell from Southeast Tech's construction program. Uh, John, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your experience at Southeast Tech? Sure. Um, so I grew up on a dairy farm um, and my dad said, don't be a farmer. <laughs> growing up he goes be anything but a farmer so um i really liked working with my hands i like being outside i like building something you know like like farming when you're planting and stuff you can see what you did at the end of the day so i like that i like being able to see accomplishment you know visually see accomplishment that you can't get in an office setting you know so um so i ended up uh going uh and i painted summers in high school my uncle owned a painting and wallpaper company so got a little little introduced through uh through kind of that and knowing kind of what a job site is and also did 4-h did a lot of woodworking in 4-h um and then uh went to a similar program that i run here at southeast tech um for a year and then uh went on to work from there so um started for a large general contractor um out of minnesota uh we did a lot of really high-end commercial um and it, we built industrial and and uh um residential as well a little residential as well so uh worked for them for 14 years i was a job site superintendent for 11 so i ran jobs managed crews ordered material all that stuff managed our subcontractors um and then from there uh for four years i was a general superintendent for a uh, really high-end large residential builder in La Crosse area here that built uh, 600,000 to three and a half million dollar homes. So, and then they oh. also did commercial or light commercial work. So they hired me to, to run their concrete crews, um, bid and run their concrete, bid and run their uh, commercial stuff. Um, and from there I started teaching. So uh, I've got a wide experience in the field um, as far as I've seen residential, commercial, concrete, um, did the bidding and estimating portion of it. So I kind of bring that to the table at, at school, you know, we teach on all those things. So, What, uh, what was the, de the deciding factor in leaving the, the field work and getting into education for you? Yeah, it was, that was a hard decision because, uh, it wasn't more lucrative in pay, <laughs> put it that way. I was making more out in the field. Um, it was a little, you know, of course it's a little easier on my body, you know, teaching is, um, I wanted, I, I seen this huge gap. There's this huge trades. It's huge. You know, we, we talk about skills gap. You probably heard skills gap, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Mike Rowe is a big proponent. We have a huge skills gap. And I think that skills gap, we're starting to close it now, but, uh, it really came about, uh, after the recession, a lot of those two, three, four-year carpenters that were really good or five-year carpenters that were really good, they all got laid off. And by the time things really ramped back up, we lost them to another industry or to another you know, career. So we had this huge gap where we had these superintendents that were really good and knew what they were doing. And we had very unskilled labor. And those middle guys that as a superintendent, I really relied on weren't there anymore because they were all gone to the recession, you know, and, and had solid jobs and we couldn't hire them back. So, um, you know, when we talk about skills gap, I think that that's pretty much sums up what I feel the skills gap was. Um, so I seen this big skills gap. I had, uh, um, you know, I wanted to be able to do something about it was part of it. And, and, you know, the job, I wouldn't say fell in my lap, but it kind of almost fell in my lap. I, I've always done extra work for play money, right? Side jobs, we call them, or moonlighting or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. So I was helping a friend's, I was remodeling a friend's basement and she works up in uh, Southeast Tech and and she's like, you should come apply for this position. I'm like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, I don't know how good of a teacher I'd be. I'm more of a, you know, hands-on guy, I, you know? And uh, so she got me up there and I ended up working adjunct a little bit. Um, kind of rewriting some curriculum um, and uh, they liked it. Um, so I applied for the job when it came up and I got the job. So um, been there for uh, just over, well, just three years now, three years, I think I've been there and uh, um, programs going good. We've had great numbers. Um, our numbers last year before COVID was, was higher than it's been in 15 years that they could track. Um, wow. so, uh, we've had good numbers, uh, good success rates. Of course, we got good placement rates cause everybody's still needing help out there. Um, you know, COVID brought me down a little bit, but I've still got pretty decent numbers. Um, uh, but you know, COVID, I think being a hands-on program, I think a lot of students were afraid to jump into it 
knowing there's a chance that we might get shut down. So mm -hmm. I, I feel that took a little bit of a hit, but um, the students I do have this year, I've got uh, 12, you know, and typically I'd have 12 new ones and, and eight returning. Um, and typically I'd have like 13 returning and 16 new ones. So just a wow. few down, but, um, but those students are all really good. They want to be there and they're all really good. So. So what, uh, what can a student expect to learn from you and your program uh, upon like in their first day? What's, what kind of expectations do you set for them? Yeah, I've, I've really got no expectations the first day. Like I would say at least two thirds of my students don't know how to read a tape measure coming in. So when I talk to high schools, I say, don't be afraid to jump in. It's not like we start with, this is how we set and trim a door. We start with, this is how you read a tape. And there's, you know, even somebody that knows how to read a ruler it's different reading a tape. We have diamonds on the tape measure at 19.2. That mean, you know, that's our layout mark for floor trusses or we have our 16 on center marks. And so there's, there's different markings on there that are actually different than like a ruler, like a tape ruler that help us as carpenters. Um, so we start there, how to read a tape. We start with safety. The, the first week we don't do any lab, it's all safety. So it's, um, you know, height restrictions, ladder restrictions, uh, what we can use where, uh, how, when we have to be tied off, when we don't have to be tied off. So um, we start very basic. We start very basic. Um, and then we, then we grow from there, you know, and into, you know, we do our own wall layouts. We make our own cabinets. We finish our own trim. Um, you know, we, so we really, we really grow from that first, but you know, if you don't have a base coming in, there's no expectancy that you have to have that base coming in. I start everybody at ground level. So we're all on the same playing field throughout. Um, Cause if you don't know how to read that tape measure and I assume you do, it's going to be a long semester, a long year for you, you know? Right. So, right. So, yeah, I mean, if you're in high school and, and you want to get a leg up, you know, take some more shop classes. Um, you know, I see in high schools, a lot of shop classes really focus on cabinetry, which is fine. You're still learning how to read a tape. You're still learning. If you miscut something, you can really see it, you know, and stuff. Um, but, you know, and, and find a summer job working for, you know, a contractor as a laborer or something, you know, it's, it's, you really can tell the difference between people that have kind of been on a job site and people that haven't, um, they grow a lot faster. I think they know the expectancy of, of you, you know, what you're expected to do, you know, when you're expected to show up and, and the, the labor it involves and stuff. So, so that it helps. It really does help. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that's kind of day one, just base level. What, uh, what do you expect yep. out of them at the day before graduation day? Okay. So, um, you know, I'll take it in chunks. Like this first semester, um, like we, we were three weeks ahead. So we just tested out. Um, we just did our finals here before Thanksgiving. So <clears throat> then we're breaking our lab up and we're actually condensing our lab into one day. So at the break here, so these people, you know, my students went from not knowing how to read a tape. Now at the break for our final, it was uh, recognizing lumber, um, being able to tell me all the different pieces and parts and dimensions of a cabinet. So standard heights, um, standard sizes of our, my rails, my styles, what rails and styles are, um, lumber identification. Two, uh, they laid out wall plates. So they laid out an eight foot section of wall with a door in it and a pocket and a corner. Um, what else did they do on their finals? They, for their concrete final, for instance, they, they told me different mix designs. They let me know um, uh, what PSI concrete goes where on your foundation. Uh, they figured yardage for walls, footings, uh, flat work. Um, you know, they told me different types of rebar, different types of reinforcement when they're used, when they're not, they figured reinforcement. Um, so that's just at the break here. So they're laying out walls. They're telling me all the pieces of our cabinets. They're telling me what goes into the foundation as far as material, rebar, concrete mix design, all that stuff, how to get it there. Um, so that's just at my break. So by the end of year one, um, I want them to be able to build a cabinet by themselves. I want them to be able to frame a wall by themselves, set a door by themselves. Uh, they're pouring, you know, we're pouring concrete. So we're pouring footings, foundations, we're pouring sidewalks. Um, we're doing some decorative tabletops. I want them to be able to do all that. Um, spray finishes. So finish all our cabinetry, finish all our millwork and doors. Um, we're laying flooring. So, I mean, we're doing the whole gamut. So by the end of year one, you really got a, a lot of experience in all different facets of, of the industry. So. Absolutely. Wow. So with, 
you know, you mentioned kind of some basic, uh, or maybe not so basic, but uh, carpentry work, and then concrete work. Is that are those the two um, pieces that that you focus on in your program? Um, yes and no, I guess, uh, you know, carpentry work, my concrete work, we really have uh, one semester of concrete work, but we still do a lot of it out in our lab, right? So um, there's not really another program around that does much for concrete work. I know one program started to do a little concrete stuff, but um, I know that they're not pouring anything per se. Okay. Um, they're maybe learning some terminologies and things like that, but we're actually working with it. We're actually doing it. We're actually pouring it out of a truck, raking it, bull floating it, grooving it, cutting it, you know, and the whole works, you know, so we're actually pouring it, you know, there's, and, and I think that's a crucial, especially with concrete is to be able to feel as it's getting hard, what it's doing, how it feels on your mag, what the wind does to it, what the, what the sun does to it, you know, and stuff and, and really being able to feel what it's doing because it's so much a feel thing. I mean, it's not, even a sight thing it's almost just a feel thing what that concrete's doing as it's hardening as the weather's making it react differently good or bad and stuff so um so concrete's a, a decent size chunk um we also do commercial and residential construction so you know we learn wood studs we learn steel studs we learn pre-engineered steel buildings we learn wood doors we learn hollow metal doors you know in, in a commercial setting so um so you know we really touch base on everything you know, a, a, a construction guy needs, like as, as a superintendent or as a field employee, even I did everything from the ground up on my jobs. Like I, one day I'd pour foundations and the next day I might be trimming a door, you know? Sure. So um, to be able to teach them that not only gives them more marketable value because here they can come out saying, I don't care if you put me doing concrete, I know what, I know how to use that wall form or I know how to, to set up the laser or the total station. Um, but you know, they could be framing or, or setting cabinets the next day. So, um, it makes them marketable. It also lets them pick what they want to do. So maybe they don't like heights. I've got three right now that don't like heights. I said, you better pay attention to concrete because we're not up very high very often when we're doing concrete. But if right. you're a residential framer, you're going to be in the air. So, um, I, uh, I tell them, you know, focus on this, maybe cabinetry, focus on some cabinetry. Um, but, but, you know, really knowing that they can pick one of those avenues, whether it be, you know, really there's four big avenues. There's cabinet making, there's concrete work, there's res residential carpenter, and there's commercial carpenter. So those are the four like main avenues. So they could pick one of those four or they could go to a place like where I was in the two jobs, they do residential and commercial and, and concrete. So they, they could get a mix of all three. So it, it, really puts the ball in their court of what, what they can pick, you know? Absolutely. So what you, you mentioned, you know, having some marketable skills coming out of your program, is that, I guess, can you talk about the benefits of going through a one or two year program before entering the, the workforce? Yep. Yep. So I have both a one and a two year program. Uh, most of my students choose a two year program because they want that degree. They want the associate's degree. And that might help them later on if they decide to go into project management or own their own company. They're going to have some more financial background to them. They can take, you know, like personal finance class, uh, project management classes. Um, and if they go to a program for like business, they've got some of that background. And I've got a student coming in that has a business background um, from Winona State, and he's going to take the construction class and he wants to be a project manager and, and blend the two together. And I called a couple of local contractors and said, hey, as a project manager, is this a good avenue, you know, so I can tell them, is it good or, you know, maybe don't waste your money. And, and they're like, that's probably more a more value to us than a, a student that just went to Stout or Platteville for project management because he has that hands-on aspect of it to know how things go together in his head. It makes him a better project manager. So, um, so yeah, I mean, there's coming into the program, I would say the biggest help is it's, it's really hard to grow fast when you don't have the basic skills, the basic knowledge, you know, and I'm not saying everybody that comes out can go and frame a house by themselves because that's usually not the case. But when your boss tells you to go grab an 18 gauge pinner, you know what an 18 gauge pinner is. When he goes and tells you to grab a structural leg, you know what a structural leg is, you know, how far can you get out in the field when, when rubber hits the road and things are moving fast and you don't know what 
a 16 penny nail is or an eight penny nail is, you know? So we know we focus a lot on terminology. We focus a lot on where it's used, how many is used there. Um, Because, you know, you're, when you come out, you're going to be the runner, you're going to be grabbing tools, you're going to be cutting, cutting boards. So you got to learn how to read a tape. You have to know what a two by four measures. You have to know what a screw is. You know, you have to know the difference between a deck screw and a construction screw. I mean, that's, you know, it's probably a hundred dollars a box difference in the two. So um, you want to know the differences in these things. You want to be able to impress that boss and that's going to have you move up faster, you know, make you move up faster, make you grow faster and, and make you more successful because you're not going to get frustrated. You know, you first week on the job and, and that boss is just screaming at you because he doesn't know, you know, you don't know what you're grabbing, you're grabbing the wrong things. Um, you know, how, how after you to stay into that trade or stay into the job. So it really is a, is a great base. It sets you up for a lot of success fast, you know, is, is the goal. I mean, the goal for my students is to be running jobs by the time they're five years into carpentry. You know, that's really my goal is in five years, I want you guys to be the boss, to be a foreman, to be working into that superintendent role. Um, and much of them I see Ken, you know, I've had as, as many, as, as few as two years running small jobs uh, in two years, you know, a year and a half, a guy that was running a flat work crew in a year and a half here, the, uh, one of my last year's hires. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the potential for, for fast growth is really a good reason to come to a program like this because no one wants to be the laborer forever. Right. Right. No <laughs> you kidding. You want to kind of work yourself into a boss position. Most people do. I mean, right. What, um, what do, what do some different opportunities look like for advancement? And you, you kind of touched on, you know, the laborer into the, the supervisory role, superintendent and stuff. Can you kind of talk through that, uh, that ladder? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you start as general labor typically, um, and then you work your way towards, uh, uh, foreman, right? So foreman's going to be in charge. Your general labor is just going to, you're, you're going to take, take, uh, um, orders from the foreman, right? So as a foreman, you're going to run, say you're doing, say you're doing uh, commercial carpentry, right? So as a foreman, you're going to run the carpenters there. You're not going to run the concrete guys. You're not going to run manage the electricians or the plumbers or the HVAC guys. Um, you're going to run just your, you know, five or 10 person crew carpenters, right? Um, so, you know, the progression from foreman then is to superintendent. So your superintendent runs the whole job site. So he orders material, for his carpenters, he calls in for will calls for his concrete guys. Um, you know, if the company you work for does concrete and carpentry, he calls and schedules all the subcontractors, meaning electricians, plumbers, HVAC, um, sprinkler guys, all them guys. Um, he sets up every, usually every two weeks, you have a meeting. So he sets up biweekly meetings. He also does four to five week look ahead schedules. Um, and compares those to the main schedule and t- try to keep job on track. So superintendents have the overall job. It's, it's your job. So as a superintendent, that's your baby. You're, it's your job, whether it be, you know, running the electricians or plumbers and telling them what to do, where we're going to start the schedule. It's all yours. So a lot of responsibility um, involved in that. And that's, you know, but that's, that's kind of the, the height of your career, you know, as a, as a carpenter, as a, um, you know, unless you want to get into the office stuff, that's, that's kind of where you top out as a superintendent. So, um, you know, you can grow, I have seen superintendents grow in office roles. Some of them like it, some of them don't, you know, and some of them don't like sitting behind the desk. They're used to that really fast paced stuff. So um, they can grow into an office role, um, you know, in a bigger company as well. So. Can you talk a little bit about the, the pay structure for, you know, kind of between the entry level uh, laborer into, you know, through those, those ranks that you just talked about. Yep. Yep. So my students are starting out 18 to 20 bucks an hour, um, right out of the program. So making decent money, uh, you know, and that's, that's working for someone commercially that's going to have benefits, 401k, health insurance, um, profit sharing, things like that. So residentially they're starting out about 22, uh, without some of those things. So, um, you get paid a little more off the, off the top, but you know, you have to do your own health insurance and, you know, unless your significant other has health insurance or whatnot. So, um, so yeah, you know, 18 to 22 an hour starting out, uh, within, you know, within, you know, the three, four years are going to be a foreman as a foreman, you know, they're making 24 to 25. And then as a superintendent, you're making 30 plus 30 to 45 an hour. So, 
um, making pretty good money as a superintendent. You know, of course, a lot more responsibility, but mm -hmm. um, you're making pretty good money. Uh, other benefits that I've had include like when you get into that superintendent role, they're usually giving you a company vehicle. So you get a truck, you get a company cell phone. Um, you know, I had a tablet as well. So I had a cell phone, a tablet, a truck. I didn't pay any gas money, didn't pay for my cell phone plan, none of that. So um, those are kind of benefits up and over the top once you reach that, that peak. So absolutely. Yeah, those are priceless benefits too. I mean, oh, yeah. when you're thinking <laughs> running over a construction site, running over some nails, it's not your tire to fix. It's <laughs> no, no, it's nice. I mean, when I, when I got my van, I dropped down to one vehicle, you know, my wife had a vehicle and I had the van and, and uh, you know, so you got one less vehicle payment that's, you know, 400 bucks a month, easy, you know, mm -hmm. and one less insurance to have on vehicles. So yeah, and, and it's big. And even your cell phone, what's, what's a single cell phone plan is, you know, hundred bucks a month, ain't it? You know, so, yeah. um, so all that stuff really has a monetary value to it uh, for sure. Like it, it kind of sucked to have to get my own cell phone once I started and I had to pick up another vehicle once I started teaching. And <laughs> I'm like, crap, I got to pay for gas now. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't paid for gas in 10 years. <laughs> so of the other, you know, trades and stuff that, that, people can get into yeah. why, why would someone want to choose carpentry and concrete and that, that Avenue? Yeah. So I chose it because I wanted to be the boss, I guess, you know, <laughs> um, I guess I wanted to run crews, you know, when I was painting, I saw that superintendent and, you know, he's kind of up on a pedestal. Like he's the man, like if he tells you as a painter to, that this has to be done, it has to be done. So, um, I wanted to be that, I guess. I wanted to be the boss. Um, uh, I also wanted to do, be able to do more than one thing. You know, even as a, even as a carpenter, you might be framing exterior walls or interior walls. You might be framing bulkheads. You might be framing stairs. Um, you might be doing floor systems. It's not like painting or electrical where, you know, you're just pulling wires or uh, making up boxes or you're just um, painting walls, right? You're just prime and paint walls. So there's, there's, I, I wanted to be having different stuff to do, right? I just didn't want to go and when I painted, I like I painted Sparta High School the one summer, and all I did was was cut indoors all summer. So I'd go to work, I'd cut indoors for 50 hours a week, and then I'd go home. You know, I didn't want that. I wanted like some variety. You know, I wanted to be outside too. And as a carpenter, we're outside quite a bit. A concrete guy, we're outside even more. You know, and so I wanted to be outside. I'm, I'm an outdoorsy guy, so I wanted to be outside working too. So. Um, you know, I chose it because I feel it's it's probably more challenging um, as well, you know, because you have to know all the different facets to it. Um, but I also wanted to be seen as like the boss on the job. I want, that was my goal. You know, I wanted to be a superintendent. That was always my goal. Um, so, yeah. That's great. And then it happened. <laughs> it happened. <laughs> yep. Even better. Yep. Yep. Is there anything that you any piece of advice that you would give to current high school students as they're looking forward into their post-secondary life? Yeah. Um, you know, start getting a good habit of showing up on time um, and, and going the extra mile. I mean, when I look at kind of what maybe, you know, in three years I was running jobs, you know, my first job was a $3.8 million house. Um, so that I ran and I probably had no business running it. You know, I was, I was 21 years old, you know, but, um, but I did and it was successful and we did a good job and, and uh, it's still standing to this day. So we did good. Um, so, you know, I think what helped me is I showed up 15 minutes early and I am, uh, by the time most of the guys got there, the job trailer was unlocked. Um, the, the building was unlocked um, and things were ready to roll. You know, I was rolling out hoses and stuff. And I was always the last one there. I was locking the trailer up. I was locking the building up. And that superintendent saw that. And that next job, that superintendent, well, who do you want on his job? He wanted me, right? Mm -hmm. So show up early, stay a little late. You know, I know you're donating some time to the company and stuff, but, you know, the benefits in the end, I mean, that really shows that you want to do this. You want to be here um, and that you want this job is yours, right? If I'm unlocking the trailer and unlocking a job site, you know, now I'm taking pride in that work. This is, this is my job. This is something that I'm building. You know, this is something 20 years from now I can drive past with my wife and kids and say, I built that, you know, um, and ask my wife, it's probably annoying to her that I say that I built that and I built this and I built that. And, and, uh, so, you know, just kind of start thinking about 
you know, what you're doing now is, as far as getting into those habits, you know, are, are you working extra? Are you doing some extra stuff? Are you get? are you being there on time? Are you, are you, or are you, you know, getting to school and, and walking in the door when the bell rings, you know, I mean, um, start getting in some of those habits um, early on and it's going to go a long ways. I mean, when you talk to these contractors, um, you know, I've had three contractors in the last three weeks come and talk to us as a class. And when I ask them what they're looking for as employees, the first thing out of their mouth is I want them to show up on time. The second thing out of their mouth is I want them to be open to learning without and, and being able to take criticism. Right. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're not even looking for, I need to, them to know how to frame a wall. I need them to know, uh, you know, how to lay this out, or I need them to know, um, you know, how to pour concrete. They're looking for, I need them to be there on time and I need them to be able to do what they're told. And if they do something wrong, be able to take criticism and learn from it and not take it to heart and be all mad about it. So um, I think that that's big, you know, and, and, and I have a grading system that, that um, takes points away if my students are late or if they're not there, or if they show up and they don't, uh, they don't tell me, right. If they are sick and they don't tell me until two days later, oh yeah, I was sick that day. Well, they have my cell phone and my students, are my crew, right? So right. my crew has my cell phone number. So my students have my cell phone number. So if they're going to be late, they can text me, hey, I'm going to be late. And I'll probably make them buy donuts. <laughs> it's usually what happens. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> that's how I was on the job site, buy Absolutely. donuts. So, <laughs> um, but there's no reason that to not communicate to somebody when you have their cell phone, you can text them. You don't even have to call them if you're sick. Just, you know, just text me, I'm sick. Um, so getting that communication across, uh, you know, and being, and I see that it's amazing how my students that don't show up on time, how much time they spend on their phone when they're there, you know, at noon, they're just looking at their phone the whole time. So, you know, like you have your phone on you, all you got to do is text me and say, you're going to be late, you know? So just getting it, that communication skills, that hard work ethic, you know, I think is going to go a long ways, a long ways. My, I have a couple of students that are struggling getting there on time and stuff. And those are the students that are doing worse in the class. They're doing worse on their tests. You know, they're, they're not handing an assignment. So, I mean, there's a direct correlation to the students that are there and on time doing everything right. And the students that aren't, and that's going to follow them right to the job site. You know, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen it, seen it follow them right to the job site. If you don't have that ethic coming to school, you're not going to have it out there on the job site. So. Is there anything else you want these high school students to know about your program, about the career, um, just that you want to make sure that you get out there? Sure. Um, like I say, my program, it was a new program three years ago. So we're not using old textbooks. We're not using old tools. We're not using old methods. Um, you know, we're using the newer stuff. We're using, you know, we have a total station that it's a $32,000 building layout instrument that we're training on. So, um, you know, we're, I'm trying to keep everything up to date and, and try to do high end everything. So we're using good tools. We're not using cheap stuff. Um, so you get some good experience with good tools and, you know, I think you're getting a decent instructor. You know, I, I'm not, you know, I tell these high school, high school kids, I get kids in every year that after the first week, they say, if you were an academiac guy, if you were just a teacher, I'd drop out but well, you're not just a teacher. And I'm not, I, I tell my students, I am a construction guy. I am not a teacher. I'll teach you how to do all this stuff, but I am not a, a I'm a construction guy through and through. Like I am, I wear my pouches and the only way I'll take my pouches off is I find myself doing the work for the students and I take them off and leave them in my truck, but I'll wear pouches with you. I'll wear, wear hard hats with you. I'll be, I'll be in the trenches pouring concrete with you. I'm not just going to stand there and not get dirty. You know, I wear my work pants to school. So, um, I'm a construction guy. I'm not a teacher. So, um, you know, don't go, don't go to a class where the guy don't have experience, you know, you don't, you don't want to learn concrete from somebody that's never poured it. You know, um, every summer I pour probably 60, $80,000 worth of concrete. So I wow. still do it. I I'm still out there. I'm, I still am keeping up with it. You know, this year, for instance, if I wouldn't, if I wouldn't do that stuff in the summer, um, and help people in the summer do it, um, I wouldn't learn the newer stuff. They, this year towards halfway through the season, I learned that we're, they're starting to put an integral concrete sealer in the concrete. It's a siloxide based sealer. I never would have known that. So now I can come to the class and say, hey, for 20 bucks more a yard, we have an integral concrete sealer that, that saves us time in the long run because for a siloxide based sealer, you'd have to wait 
28 days until the concrete's fully cured. So I don't have to go back there a month later and seal this concrete. It's done, you know, and, and we're on to the next job because contractors, I, you know, me, my, me included have a list of jobs that I have to seal before it gets colder than 50 degrees out. Right. Well, I just mm -hmm. took care of that. I don't have to spend a day going around all these job sites, sealing driveways. So, you know, have a guy, have an instructor that does it, still does it, knows the most up-to-date stuff, not afraid to get his hands dirty. Um, don't go to somebody that's just coasting to retirement teaching because I'm not, I'm 38 years old. I got a lot of life left in me. Absolutely. <laughs> well, that's great. Um, so that's, that's all the questions I've got. So um, thank you very much. Yeah. And no uh, problem. thank you. And I know um, I'll see you on Monday and we'll get kind of an inside yep. look at your lab and uh, students yeah. can look forward to that video as well. Yeah. Hopefully we got nice weather. We'll be outside doing, uh, doing some steel. We're doing a tiny house project and uh, uh, we're doing some cabinetry finishing. We're spraying some cabinets for a food pantry on campus. So yeah, there'll be a, a lot of action going on. <laughs> Perfect. Can't wait. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Thanks, John. Yep. Bye.